May peace be with you as we gather around God's Word again today. Our epistle reading from this past Sunday is from Ephesians 4. And, you know, as we dig into Paul's writings, there, you know, we're always reminded, <clears throat> and Lutherans are always reminded, and unfortunately because of the way in which some Lutheran synods, some, some groups, um, you know, the, 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 there's, there's more than one Lutheran family within North America and in many countries around the world. Um, there are not like our synod, um, and this is not boasting, but um, but there are Lutheran synods which have basically abandoned Scripture and basically said you do whatever you do you, um, so that there's there's great scandal to God's word and God's and to the witness to Christ in the way in which people simply live, um, chasing the worldly philosophies, worldly desires, chasing after all kinds of new sexual moralities and all these sorts of things when scripture speaks against those things. As Lutherans, and this became one of the criticisms of Luther and Lutheranism um, in the 1500s, is that if we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, does that mean that we can do whatever we want? And Paul was very clear, and as was Luther, that does not mean that we can do whatever we want or that our works are somehow um, not intended, uh, not shouldn't shouldn't be a witness to what God calls us to. We need the law, and we need to grow in expressing that that salvation that we have in love expressed through not only the integrity of God's word, but also you know that word which includes the Ten Commandments, the law of God, which shapes how we ought to live our lives in the world, rather than living based on our own internal passions and desires, which always lead us astray, according to Jesus' words. So as, as we dig into this, Paul digs as well, um, and, and Luther loved passages like this where he would remind people that first of all we need to understand that you know we have nothing in ourselves that can merit our salvation. Two, that God sent His Son Jesus Christ into the world in order to save us. But then three, that we are called to live in a love that reflects God's love for us, which is a redeeming love, which calls people back from their sin in order to be saved in Christ. We hear this today in the same way in which Paul reminds us that faith and, and being baptized into Christ, and this is the same letter where he talks about how we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, but that there is also works that flow from faith as a result of that faith being given. And so we dig into this in our passage here today. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, as we grapple with um, what what living our lives as Christians within this world today um, actually means, <clears throat> given the way in which, you know, our world and our society and even so many historically Christian denominations have simply said, ah, oh, these things don't matter anymore. Um, guide us so that we would not only follow the voice of our Savior and follow the voice of the apostles and prophets in the way that you have spoken through them, so that we learn to not only um, acknowledge our sins, but um, use that as a way to run to our Savior and ask him to help us grow according to your word um, in the way in which we live our lives in relationship to the people around us. Bless us today as we dig into this passage from Paul's letter to the Ephesians as well, so that as we consider our own lives and how perhaps you are calling us to grow both in our faith toward you, but then also in our service and love towards one another, that we would grow in expressing that faith in with the integrity of your word. All this we pray for in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Paul, Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And notice how he starts. And all of this follows all kinds of instruction that he's had. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And all of this is an extension of, well, the way in which Paul has written about who we are as the baptized children of God, because through faith we receive God, Christ in our hearts by faith through baptism, so that Christ takes up residence right there in the core of who we are, the heart not being the place of the emotions in biblical language, but the place underneath emotions and thought and all of these sorts of things, that God actually takes up residence so that the fullness of God comes to dwell within us by that pouring into our lives through baptism. Here, as we listen to this, basically Paul builds on this and he says, being baptized into Christ as a result, having received this gift through that water of baptism and through the word that we are called to live differently. <clears throat> 
not in the same way that you know we once were or not in the same way as you know people just building on their passions and wanting to say that that maybe is the true essence of who they are let's build on christ he's basically saying and he says as a prisoner for the lord okay both paul prisoner yes but then also prisoner as a servant to the lord he says i urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called if Christ has been poured into your hearts, don't live according to the passions of the world anymore, but instead live according to Christ, okay? And I know there's many preachers nowadays that, even like in New Testament times, where Paul and Peter and Jude especially warns about, there's these preachers that will come along and they will preach just according to their passions in order to excite people, but really they're preaching only to their own game, not to people's salvation. We have that in our world today as well. And sometimes they even carry the names of historically Christian denominations, and it's a very sad thing. Paul says, don't do that. <clears throat> Instead, let's live in a manner worthy of our calling to which we have been called. Where? In the waters of baptism by the invitation and word of Christ. And then he goes on, with all humility and gentleness, notice, not boastfulness, not, um, you know, borrowing the modern phrase that you got, just just do you and, and, and you know, or, um, speak your truth to the world. No, let's speak the truth of Christ, that we have a Savior in him. So with all gentleness, and with humility and gentleness, those words are important. Humility where we, you know, working, you know, together with the Holy Spirit, we learn to empty ourselves of ourselves. Gentleness as we relate to one another and with patience. That's a hard one. Bearing with one another in love. Okay, in love divine, not by, you know, social philosophies where, you know, love is love is love, the way in which, you know, there you know, unfortunately there's this sparkle creed that circulated around. It's an LGBTQ um, creed that, that sort of mimics and mocks the Christian creeds. Um, it's really a blasphemous creed where it, it, for the for the third article where we talk about the Holy Spirit, you know, instead they say, and I believe that love is love is love, which basically brings in, you know, all of the 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 sexual immorality of of not only the you know the sexual revolution, but then also LGBTQ philosophy into this teaching where Scripture calls it sin, but they're, they're going to make it a center part of the faith. No, no, we can't do that. Um, we need to empty ourselves. That's true for them as much as for us, um, so that we build on Christ, so that he becomes the new cornerstone. So patience, bearing with one another in love, defined by Christ. Okay, And this is the same Paul who writes in 1 Corinthians 13, where love is patient, love is kind, it's not rude, all of these things. It's self-emptying rather than self-promoting. Okay, so bearing with one another in love, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit <clears throat> and the bond of peace and the unity of the Spirit. Again, how does Paul describe that? And Again, you can go back to 1 Corinthians as a beautiful way where the unity of Spirit is the confession of one faith that Jesus is Yahweh, God in the flesh. That's that Jesus is Lord unpackaged so that the same Spirit gives us that one calling into the body of Christ by which he gifts us in different ways in order to build one another up in love. <sighs> Always shaped by that preaching and proclamation of Christ. The way we hear it, not only through the prophets leading into him by Christ himself, but then the eyewitnesses of Christ, the apostles, as they teach what they learned from our Lord and Savior. So what does he say? <clears throat> Explaining that. <clears throat> Unity of the Spirit and the bond of, of peace. Notice where he goes. There is one body and one spirit. An echo of 1 Corinthians 12. Just as you were called to the one hope, Okay, from the one body and the one spirit to which we are called through baptism, we're baptized into the body of Christ. So we were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. So, okay, that unity in faith expressed in a unity lived in humility and gentleness, building one another up in love. One Lord, who's that? Jesus. One faith, not multiple expressions of the faith. One baptism, 
Okay, and this is why historically in the Christian church, one Christian baptism with water in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is enough. You don't have to be rebaptized. It's not about the amount of water that you have, whether you were baptized as a child or as an adult. You know, we are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, sometimes people will say baptism, well, we can baptize with other elements, and so we can make rose petals. That's not baptism. Baptism is with water. Or we baptize differently in the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. And unfortunately, there are some major um, historically Christian denominations which have basically said, well, we'll just do it that way so we avoid talking about God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because it might be too, too, too much against the grain of the spirit of our age. That's not baptism either. We're talking about one baptism, the way that Jesus instituted it, with water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We don't need to be re-baptized if we have been baptized in that way, even if it was as a little child. Okay? That's, and, you know, as, as we listen to that, you know, this is historically where Christianity has always stood. So one Lord, one faith, one baptism. This is the unity that we're called to by the Spirit. Okay, one God and Father of all. Okay, notice. And so first one, one Lord is Jesus. Now one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Okay, so in other words, God, is, there's not multiple gods that we're talking about. We're talking about one Lord and Father, the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, because you don't get to him without him. All of these different ways in which Jesus taught about, you know, how we are reconnected to the very source of our life, namely our triune God. But grace, he goes on to explain, and this basically is an echo of 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Okay? Therefore, it says, when he, Jesus ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. So, again, who ascended into heaven? It's Jesus. And he gives gifts to us in baptism and communion and in his word. So in saying he ascended, what does it mean? That he also descended into the lower parts of the earth. And so we're talking about the creedal stuff. Not only was he incarnate, not only did he enter into the waters of the Jordan River to be baptized for us, then also did he entered into death and then descended into hell. It's, all of this is being depicted here by, by Paul as he writes. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. And so the same Jesus who walked on the earth, <clears throat> who was born in the manger in, in Bethlehem, is the one who ascended into heaven. And now here are some of the gifts that he gave. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. An evangelist is not talking about modern day you know, 19th and 20th century evangelists where they go out and have these great big crusades. Evangelists in the New Testament were simply preachers and teachers of the gospel, because someone who is gospeling, okay? The pastors and teachers. So the apostles and the prophets, we're talking New Testament leaders. Notice he distinguishes between apostles and the pastors that come along the way afterwards. If we have a group that claims to have a new set of apostles, or where you've got this borrowing of this phrase, apostles, and then the way in which, you know, trying to give you this idea that somehow they're better than the run-of-the-mill pastors. Okay, be cautious, be cautious. So he gave apostles, he gave prophets, okay, those who speak God's word, Old Testament, evangelists, speakers of the gospel, gospel of Christ's forgiveness, the pastors and teachers, Pastors and teachers, again, are side by side, but you can say catechists in there as well, those who teach the faith. But those two are really joined together because pastors and teachers, um, I'll fill you in on a little bit of a thing because people get their nose out of a joint. Can women teach in the church based on First Timothy 2? Well, here, um, you know, the, the, the words are very specific because as you read this, how did people translate, you know, this notion of rabbi into the Greek language? It's a very Judaic kind of a question. And, well, 
we only have to look at the end of John's Gospel where Mary Magdalene assumes that this fellow in the garden is is somehow or, you know outside of the tomb of Christ after Jesus body isn't there somehow just the gardener and then all of a sudden she realizes that this is Jesus and she says Rabboni which is the Aramaic way of saying my rabbi <clears throat> my teacher and then explains which means teacher the term teacher it, the way it's used in the New Testament does not have is not, is not so much dealing with teaching like in a classroom because they didn't have classrooms but has to do with the pastoral office and so when we see here Paul using that term Paul who is straddling both the Jewish as well as the Greek kind of a context in the background he's using them as a way to hold together two terms from two different cultural um, associations and language groups in the churches where there is both a Jew and Greek and Gentiles all over the place, which is part of the big conflict in the early church, but he's teaching to both, using language in both. So pastor and teacher, he's referring here to the pastoral office. Okay, So that as we hear that. Now, it doesn't mean that women weren't involved in instructing people, because we have the example of Prisca in the New Testament. Okay, Prisca, Priscilla who did some instructing and teaching as a right-hand kind of a helper for Paul in establishing churches. We need to keep those things apart. But when we hear the word teach, teachers, it is not the modern sense of school teacher or Lutheran school teacher or something like that, or a university professor or a seminary teacher. It has to do specifically with the way in which between the Greek and the Hebrew, it, it straddles the way in which the term, um, which eventually becomes just pastor, um, was understood in relationship to this teaching office of called rabbi, rabbi, rabboni, which means teacher, my teacher. So as we build on this, what are some of these gifts? Well, one body through one spirit, basically echoing 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, through baptism, we are baptized into the body of Christ and made members of it. And then within that body of Christ, as the Lord ascends to heaven, he gives gifts. Okay, and these are the gifts. Okay. Be cautious, though, because in the modern world, you'll get charismatic and evangelical preachers that will try to break these apart and try to say that these are things that we have to recreate in our world today rather than understanding them within biblical context. So why does he give us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers? Okay, to equip the saints, verse 12. So to build us up, the saints, referring to those who have been washed and sanctified in Christ through the waters of baptism, to do what? For the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. <clears throat> Again, echoing 1 Corinthians 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So there is a sense here that Paul is reminding us that, you know, it's not just we're baptized and it's like, don't bother me anymore with what's going on in church. There is that call to grow within the gift that we have been called to. And this is as much a part of our biblical and Lutheran teaching that we have to hold on to as the teaching that, and the essential teaching that we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That baptism actually incorporates us into the body of Christ. That God uses the washing with water and the word in order to not only cleanse us from sin, but clothe us with Christ and hide our lives in him. All of these things are part and parcel of that fuller biblical teaching. And, you know, as we hear this, this is a reminder for us, yes, I'm talking to Lutheran, but Christians as a whole, that <clears throat> the things that were, you know, hammered out 500 years ago in order to clarify things about gospel, um, they, they're, they're to help set and frame these very biblical teachings, which all hang together. We need to grow up within that. And that's why, once you're baptized, we need to continue to be part of church. That's why, as once we're baptized, we need to grow within that faith and, you know, through the Word, dig more deeply into what it is and recognize that the pastoral ministry, as well as digging into Scripture, as well as the way in which the church grows with you also being made a member of that body of Christ, 
where we too are gifted to build one another up in love with that patience and gentleness and humility. Okay, you're all those things. It applies to all of us. <clears throat> so that we continue to build that unity around Christ as we learn of him through the word, as he continues to be present in our, in our midst through the word, so that we use our Bibles like the children's song and grow every day. So until we all attain to the unity of faith, <coughs> so that, verse 14, we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, every wind of new ideas, which Paul always warns about. There's always going to be new ideas. Those new ideas don't lead you to Christ. Hold on to the one and the pattern of sound teaching it comes from Christ. It's very deep, deeper than what we often allow ourselves to imagine. Not deep in the sense of, whoa, this is complicated, but deep in the sense of, it, it, it's profound. And, 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 you know, how often do we simply gloss over the answers quickly so that we can go after whatever the latest wind of doctrine is about, you know, how you think the Holy Spirit might be doing stuff, rather than digging more and more deeply into what Paul has just talked about in the previous set of readings that we had from last week. That, you know, the fullness of God comes to dwell within us so that we become temples of God and temples of the Holy Spirit all through what God has done in the waters of baptism as he keeps pumping it into our lives through our ears, in the word, and through our mouths and our lips as he feeds us with his very body and blood in the sacrament of the altar. We need to be part of that. Not simply say, ah, whatever, that's old hat. Give me something different. No, we need solid solid food of what christ gives us that's part and parcel of the gospel reading that we had this past sunday where jesus says i am the bread of life whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never first thirst and we'll hear that over the next couple of weeks as well as jesus digs deeper and deeper into that in that john 6 passage which is a real challenge for you know the the whole group in the, within the christian world that says it isn't really what jesus says you know with the sacrament or, you know, we can just turn our backs and say this is, is more secondary stuff and we need to go and just chase after whatever is new, what we think the Holy Spirit might be up to. And the word is, you know, hogwash. <clears throat> so, part of that growing in faith, you know, involves growing up so that the way he says we're no longer children tossed back and forth by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, um, where there is that warning throughout throughout both Old and New Testament about false prophets, false teachers, people who claim to be super apostles. Paul even uses that term, not in a favorable way. Um, so that instead of just getting caught whatever seems to be new and exciting, or, 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 you know, feeding, feeding, you know, worldly sensibilities that, you know, this, this is easier because it's, it's more where society wants to be at rather than, you know, what does Christ actually say and what does God's word actually teach? We need to get back to the way that Paul says, be warned, those things are there. We need to grow up with God's word. All right. Rather, he says, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. And so Jesus being the head, from whom the whole body, <clears throat> joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. Okay, notice, every joint, every member, echoing from 1 Corinthians, where he talks about the church as a body built through baptism, so that through baptism, the Holy Spirit gifts us. We receive the Spirit through baptism. He says, building on that new baptismal identity, that it is equipped with each part, uh, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So we hear these things. This is a reminder. It's not just, okay, how come the pastor isn't doing all these things? The pastor needs to do stuff, and the pastor has a specific role. That's true. But how about the whole rest of you? Okay. Or the way in which sometimes people will grumble and complain, well, the pastor isn't doing all of these things, or the, the elected officers aren't doing all these things, and how come these things aren't happening in our church? Well, is it just them supposed to do things, or is it everybody? You also have a role 
and building one another up in love so that, you know, we, we take a look at ourselves saying, well, what am I doing in order to help build this? Or the way in which, you know, sometimes we take a look and say, well, we got to build things by batting everybody on the top of the head so that everybody snapped into position. Well, there is a certain place where the law does that. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, all of that without love, the way Paul writes in his letter to the Corinthians, we're just a clanging symbol and a gong. Um, that, that love is that essential part. And Luther picks up on the way in which Paul teaches and says, without love, you know, we, we really, you know, the question is, is what's happened to our faith? And that's an important question because the way Paul writes is that these things are important. Faith, which comes as a gift through hearing the word of Christ, the gospel. Hope, which is parachuted with that gift of faith into the midst of our lives, wherever we are, and then expressed in love. Not love is love is love, the way in which you know society likes to talk, but that self-sacrificial love where we build one another up the integrity of Christ's gift of forgiveness. So we hear this as a result, and Ephesians basically 4, as we look at it today, is, is echoed throughout all of Paul's writings, and really it's echoed throughout the whole of the New Testament, Old Testament as well as it points to Christ, but the way in which all of the New Testament writers, um, you know, lead us, that gifting of faith is something that is not just, okay, whatever, then we just go on and say, I can just do whatever I want. But instead, that gifting of faith is a new living dynamic life that God gives us. And it is supposed to be transformative. And as we hear this, it speaks to the depths and to the fullness of who we are in not only how we live on the outside, in the way that some people think, but even as we wrestle with you know, strange thoughts and schemes and all of these sorts of things, every wind of teaching and doctrine, so that we're always brought back to the center, which is Christ. And we know of him and we learn of him, not through, you know, what society would prefer that he is, but through God's word. And so as we wrestle with, you know, this whole thing of believing and following Jesus, trusting in his word, you know, and where Jesus is that bread of life. Um, this invitation within this set of readings for this past Sunday is certainly there for us to grow in that faith and that we learn to live a life that is worthy of the calling that of what Christ has given us. The Lord be with you and bless you as you chew and wrestle on this word. And may the Holy Spirit continue to gather us together into that one Lord, one faith around that one doctrine, that one teaching, that one confession of Jesus so that we can have this clear proclamation to the world in thought, word, and deed in everything that we do so that you know, that same spirit becomes alive within us as we gather together as his people within the church. Amen.